So um, we started a, a series the first part of May on 1 Timothy, and we're still in chapter one. Last week was our first week, and we looked at the first 11 verses. And, and today we're, we're looking at the rest of the chapter, which is verses 12 through 20. Um, just a, a little bit of a recap for, for last week then. Uh, as we looked at the first 11 verses, um, Paul talked a lot in there. So this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a person, and it's, it's Timothy, okay? And it's a person that Paul had worked with for a good 18 years. Timothy is younger than, than Paul is, and so he did a lot of mentoring with, with, with Timothy. And Timothy is, is definitely um, well-versed on, well on knowing what it means to start a church and be in a church and be a leader in the church. And uh, there's a situation where you've got a lot of Jewish Christians who will be joining the Gentile Christians church. And Timothy is at Ephesus, which would be a Gentile community. And, and, and so it's just trying to prepare them for these Jewish Christians who will be coming. Um, a couple carryover things. And this is the letter, right? So Paul, as he writes the letter, he's going to be talking about some themes, basically the whole letter. And so the first 11 verses, he talked a lot about faith. If you look at that, I, I, I see three times that he brings up faith. Um, and it's so important to be able to rely on faith. And he talks about having a sincere faith. And then he also talks about not being distracted from the things that are important. And then he ends up talking about the law. But what he's talking about the law is who is the law for? Well, just like a doctor's for sick people, the law is for the law breakers. And what you're going to see in the, our next verses here is Paul's going to be talking about how he himself used to be one of those lawbreakers. He just didn't, didn't know it. So in, in December 2008, uh, there was a small Thai fishing boat that sank while on an expedition. Uh, and most of its 20-something crew members were never heard from again. But 25 days later, a customs plane spotted an ice box bobbing up and down uh, near Horn Island in Australian waters. And in it were two Burmese men from this fishing boat disaster. They had made it through uh, Cyclone Charlotte. They had made it through shark infested waters by sheltering in this cooler box uh, that was usually used to store fish. So what's interesting, when we start talking about this passage today, it, Paul's going to use um, the image of being shipwrecked. And uh, for Paul himself, if you look at Acts 27 and then 28, there's a, those, that chapter and then 28, it's taken up with Paul, uh, the story about Paul and his big shipwreck. And as I look through that, he's almost killed at least three different times because of this adventure. I mean, it's, it's very harrowing. And, and so Paul knows all about shipwrecks. And then if you look in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, when it starts talking about uh, Paul gives all the terrible things that have happened to him, he lists in there that he's been shipwrecked three different times and spent an open uh, day and night on the sea. So Paul's very familiar with the whole idea of being shipwrecked, and he's going to use that image here in our passage and as he starts talking about the situation at Ephesus. Yeah, and so uh, Timothy is in Ephesus where Paul is writing to him, uh, and so he's doing ministry in Ephesus, and Ephesus is this uh, port city. It's right on uh, the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and um, you know, so uh, Carl just threw a, a slide up uh, for you to, to show you where it's at on the map. Uh, but this is a, a port city. Uh, and so it would be extremely familiar with boats, how boats worked, how they floated, how they sank, uh, what it would take to, to shipwreck a boat. Uh, 
I don't know, they might have even had uh, an idea about uh, hidden treasure and, and treasure hunts. I don't know. But so when Paul's using this analogy of a shipwreck, uh, this church would have uh, known exactly what Paul was talking about. Uh, and so today's scripture is 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 20. So that, that's the uh, chunk of verses that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, and, and a couple ideas to kind of keep in the, the forefront of your mind as we dig into this passage. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot uh, or some about uh, people who have shipwrecked their own faith uh, and people who are shipwrecking other people's faith. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander. Uh, they had shipwrecked their own faith uh, because their beliefs did not align with Jesus, uh, and likely they were causing others to follow them off course. Uh, and so this kind of makes, like Carl was saying, a direct connection to last week's sermon about who the law is for. These guys are, are shipwrecked, uh, which means they're likely the ones that Paul is talking about when he's talking about lawbreakers. So uh, let's dive into this first Timothy passage. Okay, so as we are uh, going to look at these verses, uh, I will be sharing screen so you'll be able to see them. We're not going to read through the whole verses 12 through 20 all at once until the very end. Uh, so we're gonna just gonna take it a you know, piece at a time. Uh, you can certainly look at it in your own, own Bible as we're doing it, and it's first Timothy one, verses 12 through 20. And I'm going to start out by just reading uh, 12 and 13 right now. I thank the Messiah, Jesus our Lord, who gives me strength, that he has considered me faithful and has appointed me to his service. In the past, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in my unbelief. Now, uh, as interesting as, as you look at these verses here, uh, note there's, he's already got faithful. He's already talking about that and how God has considered him faithful. Um, and then he starts listing his sins. So th this, is, this is back when Paul, he, he grew up as a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, you know, he was, he was zealous for the law and everything the way he understood the law. Um, he had a misunderstanding about the law. But, you know, so he, when Jesus comes along and he thinks, well, Jesus has to be a heretic and all that. And then the disciples, you know, are, you know, so in the early church, the early church is saying how Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus is God's anointed one and Jesus is God. And Paul's like, oh, that's horrible. That's not right. And so that's where he talks about he was a blasphemer. And here the definition of blaspheme would be one who slanders or speaks against. And he recognizes now that back then he was speaking against Jesus. He was slandering Jesus, saying that he isn't God's son. He isn't, you know, worthy of, of praise or anything like that. And so he's a persecutor and a violent man. And so, so what he's saying here, and for Paul, this was a pivotal point in his life because when he was out there persecuting the early church, and then there's this... Uh, Jesus appears to him in a bright light, knocks him, knocks him down, and asks him, you know, what are you doing, you know, and as well, you know, <laughs> it was a pivotal part of Paul's life because it was a turnaround. He turned himself completely around from where he understood God was and everything, and then he becomes a Jesus follower, and so as he's talking about this first part, he's talking about his sins, and he lists blaspheme, and I'm just going to point to, I'm not going to read verse 20 yet, but by the time we get to verse 20, we're looking at Hymenaeus and Alexander, two people at the Ephesus church where Timothy's at, and one of their sins is blaspheme. So Paul is already pointing the way toward what's going to happen there. Okay, so let's, let's keep moving here in this passage, and we're going to actually look at uh, verse 13 uh, again. So verse 13 and verse 14. Um, so Carl's going to throw that up on the screen here. In the past, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in my belief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed towards me along with the faith and love that are in the Messiah Jesus. 
So what we see here in these verses is that we see Paul is uh, listing some of the sins in his life that he that used to be present. Uh, he was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. Uh, he was violent. But then we see that all of these sins are outtrumped by God and God's power. He lists God's mercy, his grace, his faith, his love. God has more power than Paul's sins, and God overthrows that power in Paul's life, right? Verse 14 says that the grace and the faith and the love of Jesus overflowed towards Paul. It, it flooded Paul, and, and it changed him. So what's interesting here, as, as you look at this, so Paul's just talking about himself, and he, he will continue talking about himself yet before he starts talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander. But all of a sudden in verse 15, there's something different that comes up. And basically, he, it, he, it's almost like, so why did Jesus come? And there's a reason why he has it here. Let me, let me share this uh, verse with you here. Um, so this is verse 15. He just got done talking about himself. And then he says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves complete acceptance. To this world, Messiah came sinful people to reclaim i am the worst of them when you look at that and you realize um he's identifying himself with the absolute worst sinners because he knows he has completely gone against god completely gone against what god's plan is and he was trying to shut god down um What's interesting here when when you when you when you look at this, this is what God does when he talks about reclaiming people. This is what God does. He reclaims all people, he forgives all people, he gives all people second chances. And and that is amazing. Because when we can recognize that that's what God does then we have a map for our own lives and how we're supposed to live our lives. If we don't understand that, then our lives are not going to be following along the path that God wants us to have. Yeah, so then if we, if we look at the next uh, two verses here, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 16 and 17, we see that uh, Paul is kind of keeps building on this idea. Verse 16, he says, but for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the worst sinner, the Messiah Jesus might demonstrate all of his patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, the immortal, invisible, and only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So in, in these verses, uh, we see that it's because Jesus came to redeem, uh, to reclaim the sinful people that all of this is happening uh, to Paul, right? Jesus came to show him mercy and demonstrate his patience. And so Paul's life is a perfect example of God's mercy and patience, right? Paul lived a life of persecuting and killing and slandering and blaspheming God and other people. I mean, to put it simply, Paul was kind of a jerk, right? <laughs> Paul, Paul even, uh, he even calls himself the worst sinner. Uh, Paul himself was a shipwreck. Uh, his faith uh, and what he was teaching and what he was doing did not line up with Jesus, right? He was a shipwreck but he was also a shipwrecker. He was wrecking other people's faith. He was causing other people's faith to crash and burn. But then Jesus reclaims him. The, the transforming effect of the gospel is on display in Paul's life. Uh, he has experienced the effects of God's grace and it changed him forever. So, What's, what's really neat about this then, too, um, Paul is here. When he wrote this letter, he, he actually did a great job of diagramming where he wanted to go, or the Holy Spirit was helping him. My point is, he didn't just willy-nilly sit down and, oh, uh, there's all this random thoughts coming out here. So here, let me show you 
a little bit. Uh, so on, on this screen, uh, verses 13 and 14, Paul tells his story, you know, uh, of his sin. He's a blasphemer, persecutor, violent. And then he says, God still shows grace, mercy, forgiveness. Okay. Um, and then later on in this passage, Paul's going to tell about Hymenaeus and Alexander and their sin. They blaspheme, they've lost conscience, they've de destroyed faith, and I'll talk about that later. And the point is, what is the path that's going to lead to their repentance? I mean, earlier he talked about, you know, God showed him grace, mercy, and forgiveness. So what's the path going to lead to their forgiveness? And sandwiched in between his own story and what he hopes to happen to Hymenaeus and Alexander is this verse 15. To this world Messiah came, sinful people to reclaim. This is so important. This is what Paul wants his readers to understand from this letter. This is what Jesus is all about. This is why he came, and our, we have a need to help that happen out there. So with that, let me go on to these next several verses, 18 through 20. Timothy, my child, I am instructing you in keeping with the prophecies made earlier about you so that by following them you may continue to fight the good fight with faith and a good conscience. By ignoring their consciences, some people have destroyed their faith like a wrecked ship. These include Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. When, when you look at these verses here, um, there is some... <laughs> Beautiful things going on. The first, evidently, uh, Timothy, there were prophecies made over him about what he's supposed to do. And so he's reminding Timothy, hey, it might be difficult situations. And this certainly sounds like a difficult situation, particularly for what Paul is recommending Timothy do. But recognize, hey, you know what? God is with you. And you're not doing this alone. So he's reminding him of that. Then he talks about continue the good fight with faith and a good conscience. All right, so faith and conscience is what, what Hymenaeus and Alexander are going to be guilty of, of losing. So faith, what is faith? It's relying on God for answers. That's a simple version of what faith is. So let's just go with that for right now. Relying on God for answers. And what, what's a conscience? Having a good conscience? You know, we think about the conscience as that, that inner voice helping us know uh, right from wrong. And if you're a Christian, it's easy to think about, well, that's the Holy Spirit telling us right from wrong. I would also say this, since all of us are made in God's image, even if we don't know anything, we don't really have a relationship with God yet, I think that's God's voice inside us telling us right from wrong. And that's the conscience, okay? So he's saying, hang on to faith and have a good conscience. Losing these causes shipwreck in you and others, okay? Um, and, and the reason I say you and others, for Hymenaeus and Alexander, um, they, it says that they have lost, they, they, uh, by ignoring their good conscience, some people have destroyed their faith and, and they've become a, uh, it's a shipwreck, okay? So they've done that to themselves, but I'll tell you what's contagious, and it's sin. It's evil. Going the wrong direction is contagious. Now, I would say also, Having good faith, having a positive attitude, uh, having a relationship with God and showing that can also be contagious. But evidently in the church right now, you've got Hymenaeus and Alexander who they've already wrecked their own faith. You know, they, they've already uh, shown that they don't have a conscience anymore. They, they've ruined their faith. So they, they're shipwrecked. And by keeping them in the fellowship, they're going to affect other people and shipwreck other people. And so what does Paul say? He's handed them over to Satan so they may learn not to blaspheme. Okay, a couple different things about this. Handing over to Satan, it's not some kind of a, a spiritual ritual, I don't think. I think it's simply saying, you can't be part of my fellowship. You're going to come in here and you're going to preach a wrong doctrine. You're not going to show good faith and you're going to affect all of us. So you have to leave the fellowship. I think that's what Paul is saying about these two. St. Timothy, you gotta, you got to throw them out there. And that's Paul's way of talking about handing them over to Satan. And, and, and the thing I want to point out, so they may learn not to blaspheme. 
Is Paul worried that if they blaspheme, there's no coming back from that? No, because Paul already said, saw that in his own life, and he already said this in the letter, he was a blasphemer, and God showed him grace and mercy and faith and love, and so he knows it's possible for that to happen, but he's saying now, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have them, I want them cast out of the fellowship. Now, Paul used this method to bring about repentance and reconciliation, this whole handing over to Satan. He used that earlier in Corinth. Yeah, so we, so we see that Paul has used this method before. Uh, and so if we look at 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's writing to the, to the Corinthians, uh, the church in Corinth. And uh, we look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 5 uh, in this chapter uh, that Paul's writing. And he, he's talking about a man who is living with his father's wife. And there's accounts of, of sexual immorality. Uh, and so because the Corinthian church they weren't really doing anything about this. They were just allowing it to happen. Uh, Paul passage, passes his judgment on this situation. Uh, and so that's where we pick up. So let's pick up in verse 4 here of 1 Corinthians 5. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are gathered together, and I am there in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is there too, Turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Uh, and so uh, this sounds kind of harsh, right? Um, but essentially what Paul is doing here is, like Carl said, he, he's kicking this person out of the church so that they can realize the mistakes and the errors that they're making so that they can turn and repent from their behavior. Uh, now, if we flip a little bit further and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, we see that Paul is likely uh, referring back to this man that he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. And so essentially what we see here is we get to see the result of this method that Paul is using. So let's, let's start in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, picking up in verse 6. This punishment by the majority is severe enough for such a man. So forgive and comfort him, or else he will drown in his excessive grief. That's why I'm, I am urging you to assure him of your love. Uh, and so we see here, uh, Paul, uh, he knew that handing someone over to Satan uh, means that, you know, it, it's a means of getting them to repent and reconcile. We see here that this has happened, and so now they're, they're supposed to invite him back into the fellowship and, and, um, and, and show him their love, right? And so he used this method in the, in the Corinthian church, and it worked, and so now he's trying to use this again in the uh, church of uh, Ephesus. And, and so... I'm just going to point you back then to this, this, this screen here about this verse 15 right there in the middle. Um, he's telling his own personal story, and then he's talking about these, this, these two people. They need help. They need spiritual help. They're going down the wrong path. And then he reminds everybody, to this world, Messiah came, sinful people to re reclaim. And then one of the things he ends up saying there also, I am the worst of them. And I think that's just so important to, to recognize. One of the things Paul is trying to make sure that the people understand, if God can show mercy and grace to Paul, then he can do it for any of us. Showing grace and mercy and endurance and faith and love. That is so important. And that's what God does for us. So this is... Uh the the part of of the sermon that we want you to get that piece of paper uh and that pen or pencil out or journal whatever whatever it is you have uh and we want to we want to just give you a couple questions to reflect on maybe to jot down some some uh, ideas um to to be able to go back and, and reflect on that later on even um and so so grab that and we'll give you 30 seconds 45 seconds to a minute or so uh, to reflect on each of these questions, um, and then we'll keep keep.
keep moving here. So the first question that we want you to reflect on here is what are the situations in your life where grace, mercy, endurance, faith, and love from God needs to be present? Uh, so maybe another way to say that is where do you need to be open to God's grace in your life? What are situations where you need to be open to the grace of God? Another question then to reflect on would be this. Where do you need to be like Paul is here in this passage where he's ready to extend that grace and mercy, uh, faith and love to somebody else out there? Uh, maybe it's somebody who's hurt you. Maybe there's some kind of a grudge or maybe, you know, it's just somebody hasn't forgiven you even though you didn't do anything wrong or whatever it is. But where, what situations are there like that? where you're wrestling with and you really just need to extend grace and mercy, uh, faith and love to others. So then uh, in if you're looking at your, your situation of faith or uh, your life through the terms of being shipwrecked, um, there's a couple different areas I think that um, we can fall into. Uh, are, are you sinking, um, uh, struggling hopelessly uh, with absolutely nowhere to go? Uh, or are you staying afloat? Um, and then is staying afloat good enough? You're, you're above the water, but you're not moving anywhere. Or are you keeping the course? Uh, you're following a map that, that is set ahead of you and you're, you're moving somewhere. Or at a, are you at a point of, of helping others stay the course? You're, you're staying the course yourself and then you're bringing others along with you uh, in this positive direction. Uh, and so then the question is, uh, you know, what situation do you find your faith in, your life in? Uh, and then what action, what action do you need to take depending on the situation that you're in? And so, so if you find yourself sinking, uh, your, your faith is, has hit rock bottom, your, your life is spiraling out of control, uh, what do you need to do? Uh, and I would say you need to grab onto the life raft. Uh, and that life raft in this situation of our faith, of our life, is Jesus. Uh, it is God's word. Uh, so read the life-changing, the transforming words of Jesus. But I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say to stop there. Uh, I think you can also call out for help. Uh, reach out to someone that can help you. Uh, and don't reach out to someone who is in the same situation as you. A sinking person cannot help another sinking person, but you have to reach out to someone who is able to help you, someone who is a strong, mature follower of Jesus that can help you. And uh, if, if you're in the situation where you're just staying afloat and, and you think, well, you know, you're looking at the people sinking around you and you're thinking, well, hey, I'm not sinking, I must be doing okay. Is that, is that good enough? you're just staying afloat. You're just going along with the drift. Um, I, 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 I made a gaffe here. I, I brought a show and tell item to a thing where I'm sharing my screen, which means you can't see what I'm holding, <laughs> which is, that's too bad. I, I guess I should have left this in the closet. I have a compass with me. Okay. Uh, so if you could see it, I'm holding up a compass. A compass helps you know where true North is at. Once you know where true North is at, then you can decide what direction you're supposed to be going or what you should be doing. So if you're just staying afloat, but you realize I need to have more direction than that, ask God for direction. Uh, chart a course. Uh, and you can do this through Bible reading. Uh, Dennis did a great job just explaining how all of a sudden you realize, you know what? I can spend more time reading the Bible. Uh, now, uh, can we sustain that in our hectic schedules that we normally keep? We should. Okay, I mean, but I'm just saying, 
reading the Bible, uh, studying God's Word, and actually reading the Bible and studying God's Word are two different things. They go hand in hand, uh, but, but the idea is studying God's Word. Uh, I would also suggest that accountability partner would help here. If, if you're just staying afloat, but you want to be moving on where you know a direction to have a course, get an accountability partner, someone who will help you uh, maintain that and pray with you and stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, whether you're sinking or staying afloat or, or you find yourself, uh, you're keeping the course. Um, what do you need to do if you feel like you're keeping the course? Uh, and I think it relates back to what Carl was saying of, of charting a course. Um, once you have that compass out and you know where you're going, uh, keeping the course requires action. Uh, you, you, you might have your map, you might have your plan, but if you're not doing something with it, you're still just staying afloat. Uh, and so how can you continually put those things into action to where you're growing closer to Jesus? Uh, maybe like Carl, Carl said, uh, you're engaging intentional prayer or, or, or time in scripture, uh, or maybe you're implementing other kinds of spiritual practices like fasting or silence and solitude. It, so whatever it is, once you have that course, put it into action. Uh, get those couple people that can, can keep you accountable and help you stick with it. Um, but keeping the course requires action. And if you're not moving somewhere, you're just staying afloat. And then the last one we would have on there is helping others stay on course. So let, let's say, yeah, you know, you're, 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 you're an experienced Christian and, and you don't find yourself falling into the same pitfalls anymore and you've got good direction in your life. Are there other people around you that you could take under your wing? And you know what? You don't have to actually make this a formal mentoring uh, kind of a, a, a statement, or you don't have to call them up and say, hey, can I mentor you? You just decide that, you know what? Hey, I'm, I'm, you want to go out for coffee or, or whatever. I mean, and you just try to help. Sometimes it's just from your own um, example in your own life. You could be a mentor that way. Sometimes it's taking the person under a wing and saying, hey, you want to read a, a, a Bible book with me or a study book together, and we can do that together. Uh, so like here, uh, you can see me now here, here, I got, I got a couple compasses. So, you know, I still think that compass is a good thing. It's just too bad. Nobody could see it. But I, I think as you, you look at this whole idea and you recognize, you know what? I want to pay attention to the idea of shipwreck and I don't want to be shipwrecked. And so what can I do and how can I bring others along with me, uh, to be able to grow? And, and, and like uh, Nick was saying earlier, w when you are looking for growth, you have to pick people that you, who are ahead of you on the growth platform so that you can grow with them. Um, reading a John Ma Maxwell book this, this last year, he, he talked about um, if, if you, when you gather together, um, he said it a couple different ways, but if you're the smartest person in the room when you gather together, you're never going to increase your intelligence, okay? So now put that in your spiritual life. If you're always the person who's who's like, oh, well, everybody else beneath me is, is sinking or barely swimming, you know, but I'm up here. If that's all you ever have, you're not going to grow either, okay? So you, you look for people who 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 feel like, oh, they, they look like they, they, they have a better idea of their direction or whatever and, and be able to do that. When when we also looked at this passage, we also looked at the idea, you know, so what are the actions that the church is called to in this passage? And that would be toward that last part, hold on to faith and a good conscience and fight the good fight. Fight. We, we are asked to do that, to make sure that we can hold on to the faith, have a good conscience and fight the good fight. For you, what does this look like as you think about the church? Are there areas that you feel like, yeah, as a church, we ought to be growing in these areas? Well, then let's figure it out. Let's work on it. But um, in particular, in light of verse 15, which was all about Jesus came to reclaim those who are lost. And so we want to be able to, to have that. Right, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, share the scripture. We're going to, as we end, end this, this time, we want to be able to look at look at these, uh, the, the whole verses that we just studied here. I thank the Messiah, Jesus, our Lord, 
who gives me strength, that he has considered me faithful and has appointed me to his service. In the past, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in my unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed toward me, along with the faith and love that are in the Messiah Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves complete acceptance. To this world, Messiah came, sinful people to reclaim. I am the worst of them. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the worst sinner, the Messiah Jesus might demonstrate all of his patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, the immortal, invisible, and only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my child, I am instructing you in keeping with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them, you may continue to fight the good fight with faith and a good conscience. By ignoring their consciences, some people have destroyed their faith like a wrecked ship. These include Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. As as a look at this passage, and just as we talk about that study, and, and Nick and I, we, we dialogued a lot this week about this passage. I, I love the example that Paul gives. It doesn't matter what's been in your background. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can still be redeemed. And, and that is true for anybody out there. And we just need to recognize that and to recognize, too, that's why Jesus came. And that's the work of the church. Then we're carrying on Jesus' work. And so we want to be able to go ahead and do that. Uh, please bow with me in, in prayer. We'll, we'll end this time with a prayer. And then uh, we'll, I'll, I'll give a few instructions for what's going to happen next. So please bow with me in prayer. Lord, as we come before you, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the example of Paul and what you did in his life. And I thank you for how he passes that knowledge down to Timothy and then also to us. Lord, bless us with your presence. Help us to be able to know what it is you would have us do. How do we grow? How do we do the tasks you would have us do? And just bless us with your presence and give us that strength. And I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.